to Jesus. Wow, beautiful to be here again on the Marvelous Believers Show. And thank you for tuning in. Thank you for finding time to be here with us, to fellowship with us. And as usual, I know God is going to speak to us. He has a word for you and for me. So welcome to the show. Remember to share this link with someone. And I believe we shall be a blessing to as many as we can share with uh, let me just start with a short prayer and then we shall go to the word. Father, we thank you for this opportunity once again to share your word. Uh, the Bible tells us that your word is spirit and it is life. The entry of your word brings light. And so we believe even as we share your word in its simplicity, it will speak to us, it will encourage us, it will empower us, and our lives shall be changed. We thank you for everyone who is viewing and those who will view later because we know your word has never lost and it cannot even lose its power. It will accomplish that which you have sent it forth for in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, like I have prayed, I believe the word of God will always accomplish that which has, it has been sent for. Even today, as we share the word, there is what God wants to, to speak to each one of us. Very differently, by the way, everyone has what God wants to speak to each one of us. And so may we be blessed even as we share this word. Uh, today, I am sharing a, a topic that I titled uh, what I know each one of us has maybe experienced or gone through, the sinner's prayer. If you are born again, most likely you are made to, you, you, you repeated this prayer maybe after someone or you are made to do this prayer. And so I'm talking of something that we are very familiar with. And it's, there's nothing wrong with the prayer that we always make when we accept Jesus in our lives. I think it's in agreement with what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, and I'll just start straight away with it. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10. The Bible says from verse 9, 9 and 10 actually, uh, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it is the right thing, I believe, when we, lead, we meet people, we lead them to the Lord to help them. When we ask them, maybe repeat after me, and you lead someone to repeat those words, it's because we are helping them to confess. Maybe someone has just maybe has never prayed, maybe does not know what they should pray about. So when we lead them, we are helping them because the Bible talks of believing in the heart and confessing with the mouth. So that's actually right. And we always lead, you know, the prayer that we always make, forgive me, uh, remove my name from the book of, remove my name from the book of death, write my name in the book of life and things like that. So that's what I want us to uh, it's found on all to discuss today. That's what I am just thinking about. It's something that I think I have thought about once or twice in the past, and I thought I could bring it up so that I, I am maybe I can try to speak my mind and maybe see what we can all get from it. I believe someone, something God will speak to us. There's something that uh, God wants to speak to us. So I want to discuss like what really happens when we get saved. What are we forgiven from? When we say forgive my sins, because now we have accepted Jesus, what are we being forgiven from? Is it forgiven from maybe stealing, maybe drinking, maybe telling lies, maybe jealousy, maybe prostitution? What are we being forgiven from? Because that's usually the prayer. Forgive my sins, remove my name from the book of wherever, to, and write my name in the book of life. What exactly are we telling God to forgive us from? That's about what I want to talk about today. And as usual with this show, I think so many times I have gone back to the beginnings. I like going back to the beginning. Sometimes it helps us to understand some concepts. So if I should go back to the beginning, uh, when man fell, 
man, man was created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. Man was in the very nature like God. God created man in his own likeness. Man was as spiritual as God was. But man fell, and these are stories that we've repeated so many times, so I know we all know. So when man fell, one of the things that he lost is the image of God. He lost the nature of God. He died spiritually, not physically. Obviously, he didn't die physically. God had told man, the day you eat of this, you will die. So the day man ate, we all know that Adam actually didn't die physically. We even know that that's when maybe the eyes were opened and they ran to hide and they were. So he didn't die physically, but he died spiritually because he got separated from God. He lost the nature of God. He lost the dominion and the authority that God had given him. He handed it over to the serpent. So it's like he, he lost his presence from God and he joined with the devil. That's, that's what happened when man fell. And that now became the ultimate sin over humanity. That became the sin that affected man spiritually. Because man is a spirit. God created man as a spirit before a physical man. So the sin of uh, falling from the presence of God, the sin of being separated from God, the sin of Adam falling from the nature of God is the one sin that God held against humanity because that's the sin that affected the spirit of man, not the physical, because the physical Adam did not die, but spiritually he died. And so when we talk about sin, even as I will go back to, the Lord, to this prayer that we always make, I want us to know that that's the one sin that God held against humanity because that's the sin that actually affected the status of man spiritually, the spirit man. And uh, I'll read a verse in Genesis chapter 5. I know I have ever read it again, but it does no harm. 5 verse 3. The Bible says, now this is after man has fallen. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Adam, after he fell, he now started begetting sons. And the Bible says he got a son in his own likeness and in his own image. The old concept of the image of God and the likeness of God has been deleted, has been left behind. Now Adam is begetting children in his own image, in the image of the fallen man, in the image of the or disobedient man. It, there is a new race that is coming up, a new race of the fallen man, a new race of the disobedient uh, humanity. That's what Adam brought up. That is why every time we say, uh, before you get born again, everyone is a sinner, not because they have sinned. They are born sinners. We are born in the nature of sin. That's where it started from, because Adam now brought up a new race that was in his own image. And remember, he was a fallen man. And so now humanity became a sinful nature. And that's what started coming up. So back to my question, what are we being forgiven for at salvation? What is Is it the stealing? Is it the alcoholism? Is it um, maybe prostitution? Is it jealous? What are we being forgiven for? And if I should ask, what about Maybe some people who get born again when they are still a bit young, maybe not yet gotten into too much of what we repent for at uh, salvation. Some of us, when you got born again, maybe you, you repented one or two things you can remember. Maybe I had a lot of temper issues. Maybe I was drunkard. Maybe I was one, two, three. But there are people who get born again even before their life has exposed them to these things. But they still have, they still need salvation because humanity is fallen and it is only salvation that can make someone righteous. So if we are to go with the repentance that we do, what would those people repent? Or when they repent, what do they repent for? All these people who, you know, there are people who are good actually. There are people who are good. There are people who are even old and maybe they cannot pick something that they would say, this is what I am repenting. Some people are brought up well and they have lived good lives and maybe they haven't gone into anything that you can pick and say repent of this so when we talk about forgive me my sins which sins are we talking about that is the question praise be to jesus uh, allow me to read second corinthians chapter two second corinthians sorry chapter five 
and verse 21. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we can be made the righteousness of God. So God made Jesus, that sin, that sin I'm talking about, the sin of the fallen man, the sin, the only sin I'm saying, the only sin that God can hold against humanity or God could hold against humanity, God made Jesus to become sin, not even to become a sinner, to become the sin itself. Jesus died as sin. He took, he paid for that sin. He took that sin and paid for it. He took the debt of that sin from humanity and paid for it with his own blood at the cross. In his death and resurrection, he was saying, I have now picked that sin, the sin that God, you have, my father, you have held against humanity. I want to pay for it. And he paid for it at the cross so that as we can be, it's so that it is possible for humanity to, to find righteousness, so that it is possible for humanity to be made righteous. So he became sin. He paid for that initial sin. Even for those who are not born again, by the way, Jesus already paid. The debt was paid. Even those who have not yet received Jesus, it is just that they have not yet accepted, but the debt has already been paid. Even before you who is listening to me, Gave your life to Jesus, the debt had already been paid. Even before you were born, even before you sinned, Jesus had paid. So Jesus did not come. It's not at that moment when you said, Jesus, come in my life, forgive me. It's not the moment he died. He had died long before you even sinned. Long before you even made those uh, repentance prayers, he had already paid for the debt. So back to my question. So what are we repenting? I mean, what, what is this sinner's prayer we make? What, how, how do you think? What do you think about it? Because in my opinion, if, it were, if I were to lead someone and I'm talking to us, you who is listening to me, I believe we are all believers. And even if you are not, you are learning from it now. And you can make this prayer with me. That when we lead someone to the Lord, I want it to be in our conscious that we are not just repenting the sins they can pinpoint at the sin the admit sin that held humanity was paid for by jesus at the cross if there is anything someone can do it is to thank god for his son it is to thank jesus for becoming sin for us it is to thank jesus for taking our position so that we can uh, find righteousness it is actually to accept the gift of salvation at that moment when you are allowing jesus in your life what you can do is to accept the gift of salvation. I like what one pastor had posted the other day. He was asking, is salvation a gift or a reward? Salvation is a gift. It's not a reward for repenting. Because if you think it's a reward, God has rewarded me with salvation because I repented. Uh, you will go wrong at one time. But salvation is a gift that was already paid for and was waiting for you to accept or to pick it by allowing Jesus in your life. So when it comes to uh, making the prayer, I think more of it would be uh, thanking God for that gift and accepting the gift of salvation. So one of the things I've, I think I've been thinking about with the prayers that we make or we make people to repeat when they give their lives to Jesus, the prayer of repenting from one, two, three things. Because when someone says, forgive me my sins, in their mind, they know what they are talking about. They are talking about that sin that I know. Because I lose my temper too fast. Because I can, I steal. Because I'm a drunkard. Because I'm a prostitute. Because I do one, two, three. They have something in mind. And when we make that kind of a prayer, we seem to peg salvation to that repentance. It's like you're pegging your salvation to that repentance prayer that you made. So that if one day... Maybe uh, you have repented because you've been losing your temper with the anger issues. And one day someone steps on you and you almost snap. You start getting condemned. Condemnation kicks in because now I repented for that sin and here I am. I have lost my temper. I repented for that sin and here I am. I have been tempted. I have done one, two, three. I have said one, two, three. Condemnation begins to kick in. So Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. He said, there is therefore now. 
no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul was not writing to angels. He was writing to the Romans. He was not writing to spirit beings. He was writing to people that he knew they were prone to fail. He was writing to people that he knew they have flesh and blood. Their spirit is born again and is saved. But he knew he's writing to people that maybe could fail here and there. So he tells them, I want you to know there is no condemnation because the initial, the ultimate sin against you, Jesus paid for it and you accepted that gift of righteousness. So when we understand that, because what happens is when you peg salvation to that repentance, uh, I repented for doing this and now I have found myself here. You, you condemn yourself. The devil begins to condemn you. He is the accuser of brethren. He begins to accuse you. Even through people or even through yourself, he begins to speak to you. And the next thing you know, you are losing faith. You are losing power. You are losing confidence. In fact, at one time, you start, if anything should go wrong around that time, the devil will quickly even tell you that God has punished you for that. Very easily. Something goes wrong, a business deal goes wrong, you, put, you, you are so stressed because you are so condemned, you put your phone wrong, someone picks it, maybe you believe God is punishing you. And before you know it, you are almost bitter even with God because now me, I can even forgive my child. How can you not forgive me? I didn't go to church on Sunday, so I am now condemned and so God, you are punishing me for that. You can easily lose your faith. You can easily lose your position. You can easily forget that the ultimate sin was paid for and you live in condemnation and you live almost accusing yourself for that failure. But we need to understand where, what exactly has happened when we give our lives to Jesus. It's not just the repentance. It is greater than that. Paul, in, in the book of Colossians, as I approach maybe towards the end, Colossians chapter 2, I would like to read it for us. Colossians chapter 2 and um, verse 12. Let me just read it for us. Colossians chapter 1, I think. Not 2. Chapter 1, verse 12. The Bible says, this is New King James Version, Having, uh, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. You have been qualified to be a partaker of the kingdom. And then Paul goes ahead and says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He has actually delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us and brought us to His kingdom. Maybe I should read it in... In a new translation, new living translation, it says, Always thanking the Father, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. For He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us and transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son. He has rescued us. When you got born again, you were rescued from the kingdom of darkness and you were transferred. This version says transferred us into his kingdom. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Maybe I could check what Passion Translation says about this. I believe your hearts can soar with joyful gratitude. Sorry, I lost it. Your hearts can soar with Joyful gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to us by living in the light. Freely given to us. And then verse 13, he says, He has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. He has completely rescued us, completely delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into his kingdom. Glory be to Jesus. So when you gave your life to Jesus, something happened, something greater than just being forgiven, something greater than just repeating, you know, that prayer and repenting of sins. Something happened. You changed residence. You changed belongings. You changed your status quo completely. You became a son of God. Your nature changed from the nature of darkness. You were rescued from that kingdom. And you came into the kingdom of light and your nature changed completely. 
into a new nature and that is the nature of God. So when we go to give to that prayer or when we come to uh, the point of receiving salvation, um, maybe just to, I, I don't want to misquote it. I want to quote it correctly, what Paul said in Romans. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, you will be saved. For the heart, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness. It is a question of believing in your heart. Once you believe in your heart, you believe unto righteousness. I like what someone had, uh, I ever read somewhere. Someone was saying, Abraham believed and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Not Abraham behaved. Abraham believed. You believe unto righteousness. You cannot behave unto righteousness. You can only believe unto righteousness and that righteousness can help you maybe to correct a behavior. But be behaving, you can never be able to correct your behavior until you have believed unto righteousness. And then that righteousness helps you now to correct if it is about correcting your behavior. So it says, you believe unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So once you believe in your heart and you confess that which you have believed, not confessing, let me tell you, at the moment that you gave your life to Jesus, at the moment that you made up your mind that you believe in this Jesus, that he died for your sins, that he paid for your sins, and you want to live uh, that new life, uh, Second Corinthians uh, chapter 5 verse 17 says, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. You become a new creation. The moment you've believed in your heart, before even you spoke, you believed in your heart unto righteousness and confession was made unto salvation. Before you repented of everything, you were already a changed person. You are a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. So by the time you have reached that point, your nature has been saved. You have become a new creation. You are new. You are born again, born afresh. So those things that you are repenting, those things you are mentioning actually are not with you here. Maybe your mind is still not renewed. It's not able to think they are forgotten. But the minute you allowed Jesus in your life, before even you started mentioning and pointing them out in your mind, they were forgotten. You became born again. You became a new creation. The old is gone. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation. The old is gone and new has just begun. So having the right knowledge of what happens when we become uh, born again gives us, helps us, even as we continue in this journey of faith, gives us the confidence. Because should one find the flesh has failed somewhere, you don't just succumb and, and they decide, I am now defeated, I am now condemned. I am now a backslider. I cannot make it. And you give up and you give up and you go and you go never to be found. No, you quickly identify this is not in my kingdom. This is a trespass. This is a foreigner in this kingdom. I cannot say because yesterday I lost my temper. I shouted, now I am a backslider. That losing temper is a spirit. There is a spirit behind it. And it's a trespasser and a foreigner in this kingdom where I belong. I can rebuke that spirit. I can reject it from my, my, uh, from my life. I can command it to live my life. And I rise up again. And I know I am a child of God. And I am not condemned. And I know before even I could accept Jesus, he had paid for my sins. Before even I sinned, before even I repented of those sins, Jesus had uh, paid for those sins. And when I accepted salvation, I was accepted in the kingdom of God. So if Jesus could pay for your sins before you even repented them, before you even uh, knew you were a sinner, he had paid for them, how much more now when you are called a child of God? How much more now when you are actually a son of God? So when we understand what exactly we do when we repeat that prayer, what exactly we do when we allow Jesus in our lives, what exactly we do is that we receive a gift that has already been given, that has been waiting for us, then we can walk with strength. We can walk without condemnation. We can walk with confidence in this new life, knowing that we are now sons of God. We are now seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We cannot be condemned. When the flesh fails, we rebuke that spirit and our strength is renewed and we continue. 
let us renew our mind to that position because that is who we are, even as we call ourselves the marvelous believers. I want to pray with us. As we end, I just want us to pray. And in this prayer, I want to make declarations that I want you to continue making, even after this show, even after today. I want you to continue declaring. I want us to just say, thank you, Lord, because of Jesus Christ. Thank you because Jesus took our place. He became sin so that we can be made the righteousness of God. So we thank you because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are not condemned. We are sons of the kingdom. We are new creation. We have been made new creation. We are born again. We are a new creation. We thank you, Jesus, for taking our position for your death and resurrection. So now we are hidden in you. We are hidden in you in heavenly places. We are seated with you in the place, in the position of power and authority. We are reconciled back to God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I want to stop there. And uh, we shall, I want to continue in this line, maybe in the next one or two weeks. So uh, be sure to be with us. Be sure to join us. And I know it will only get deeper and better. Thank you again for finding time to tune in and to fellowship with us. This is our Emma TV and the Marvelous Believers Show. You are blessed. <laughs>